Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is David Nywert author of The Age of Insurrection, The Radical Right's Uncivil War on American Democracy. It's published by Melville House. It'll be released on June 27th. David's other works include Alt-America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump, Red Pill, Blue Pill, How to Counteract the Conspiracy Theories that are Killing Us, and even of Orcas and Men, What Killer Whales Can Teach Us. So, you know, I don't like to talk this way, but it's my own knee-jerk alt-left position. But, you know, I hate to use the word hate, but this is my knee-jerk response. I hate Trump. I hate DeSantis. I hate Tucker Carlson. I hate Marjorie Taylor Greene. I even hate Mitch McConnell. But I also really don't like Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, Dianne Feinstein, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris for different kinds of reasons. And I don't want to feel that way about anyone. I really don't. So. I may, maybe I'm just as bad as the alt-right. I have knee-jerk responses to conduct I deem abhorrent, and it makes me sometimes into the very person I fervently don't want to be. So David has dissected, attacked in a great way, and decimated in all of his works, especially in this one, because of the history he provides. The radical right. And I agree with everything he has to say in this book. But as we, we talked, chatted about before the interview, I don't know who else is going to be agreeing. It's like someone who listens to Tucker Carlson is not going to listen to this and change his opinion in my, in yeah. my mind. So where does that leave us? Especially as senseless violence and AI and deep fake threaten to destroy democracy on their own and perhaps mankind, according to many scientists who developed AI. Plus, I'm naturally a fatalist. So other than anxiety meditation and constant <laughs> meditation, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, we could just talk about the last three weeks for a couple of hours. But what I want to do is because the way David's framed this book is, um, well, let's, let me, let's see if he has answers to the questions I have. So welcome, David, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hey, so the cool thing about the beginning of the book is, you know, a lot of people a lot of Democrats who are kind of sleepwalking, as you might say, um, they think back to January 6th, they think back to Charlottesville, they think back to Trump, still thinking about Trump, they think about DeSantis. But what you do in the beginning of the book is you go back in time. And I think that might be a good way to begin to like, I mean, it's really complicated, but to maybe start off by telling us when this all began, how it began and how it turned from like just this, this tiny grassroots movement into this behemoth that it is today. Sure. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I, of course, I only go back really to the 1990s in the book, but honestly, a lot of this could can go back a hundred years to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and those neo-fascist elements that have always been in American society. And people will often forget that, you know, Hitler and the European fascists drew a lot of their inspiration from America. Uh, you know, the the clan or the clan inspired the brown shirts. The uh, uh, Jim Crow laws inspired the Nuremberg laws. Uh, uh, the American genocide of Native Americans inspired Hitler's ideas for Lebensraum, which ultimately led to the Holocaust. So these threads have always been in our culture or have been in our culture for a long time, uh, but they really um, uh, started bubbling up uh, out of the swamp in the 1990s. And so that's sort of what where I start telling the story uh, with the, you know, rise of the Patriot Militia Movement, um, which is, you know, really much of the heart of this anti-democratic force, this anti-democratic movement that we're dealing with now. Um, and because it was a form of right-wing extremism uh, that 
dealt with conspiracism was uh, was very much adjacent to white supremacism uh, and was uh, always threatening street violence. Um, that naturally the, the sort of movements that followed uh, it, out of the radical right, such as white nationalism and the street brawlers and the conspiracy theorists, they're all, yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount of overlap among them, but because they're all connected in a lot of ways, mostly by the underlying conspiracism. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it really started taking off during the Tea Party years um, in, in response to having a, an African-American president. And uh, the... It, and it happened also to follow a period of really rising authoritarianism that occurred after 9-11, with all the fear-mongering that uh, surrounded 9-11. Uh, what we saw in American politics, particularly from Republicans, was this uh, promoting authoritarian uh, sensibilities, authoritarian ideas. Um, you know, especially the well. If you don't like, if you if you don't support Bush in the war, then you're a traitor. Sort of stuff that we saw following 9/11. And so the when the Tea Party started taking off, it also was melding with this rising trend of authoritarianism within the Republican Party, and uh, they just naturally melded. I mean, uh, remember how. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we've definitely been dealing with all this time for the last 20 years is this, um, the fear mongering about immigrants and the seeing immigrants as a threat. And this was always a fundamental element of, this is a fundamental element of some of the early 20th or 21st century uh, authoritarianism or extremism that we saw down on the border with these Minutemen doing vigilante border watches. Um, and it folded into the the Obama years, all the fear mongering about immigrants and the border and, you know, culminated with Trump, you know, build the wall and, and all this stuff. And, you know, and, and of course, during Trump's uh, tenure as president, he constantly beat that drum uh, about immigrants, you know, th you know, the caravans of immigrants that were going to be threatening us at the border and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, this kind of fear mongering is really fundamental to inducing authoritarian responses in the public. Um, well, let's, let's, let me ask you this, because there's so many factions that I'll pull out one that demonstrate what I was saying about Democrats kind of being lulled in this to sleep kind of being stupid and not having AR-15s. So like, <laughs> take the Proud Boys. So a lot of Americans, a lot of Democrats think, oh, the Proud Boys, <laughs> Trump said, march down to Capitol Hill, I'll follow you. And they think, okay, that's how the Proud Boys started. Or yeah. the Boogaloo thing. But, the, so, but that's not how the Proud Boys started. You need mm -hmm. to explain that. Yeah, uh, well, I started seeing Proud Boys for showing up on the streets in spring of 2017 uh, during a lot of the uh, sort of early protests against um, uh, the rise of extremism on the right. You know, we saw uh, them turning out to uh, create scenes of violence in places like Portland and Seattle and, and San Francisco. Um, and their whole purpose was, you know, they were doing it under the rubric of uh, free speech, saying that, you know, they're trying to uh, secure the free speech rights of conservatives to say what they want, and mostly because, I mean, a lot of the, some of the earliest protests involved uh, Miley Yiannopoulos, the, the alt-right figure who was going around and doing college campus tours, and when he would do so, then anti-fascist groups would show up to protest. And this is when we started seeing groups like the Proud Boys, these street brawlers. Uh, it, it wasn't just the Proud Boys, of course, in, here in the Northwest, we had an outfit called Patriot Prayer. It was very closely associated with the Proud Boys. And in fact, 
uh, attracted a number of the notorious Proud Boy participants, including uh, Ethan Nordeen, who was one of the, the major January 6th figures. Um, but basically their whole purpose was not, you know, the, their whole intent was to build this narrative about a violent left. Um, and they were going to build that narrative by creating scenes of street violence that the, the media would then report upon as being, um, you know, these poor right-wingers being descended upon by vicious leftists and uh, anti-fascists. And, um, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they built that narrative very well. I mean, it became basically the conventional wisdom by 2018 that this was what was happening. Uh, they created a bogeyman in the form of Antifa, uh, which was um, which is actually a very tiny faction that has very little actual influence in our discourse, um, and uh, made them out to be you know the essence of evil, it, <laughs> and uh, evil itself. And you know they were doing this as a way of um, legitimizing street violence. Um, cool. Well, like, so should we, if we're trying to change things or if we're trying to understand the concepts that you've brought up in your book, you know, you could do Boogaloo, you could do the neo-Nazis, fascists, the people who promulgate the conspiracy behind Pizzagate. Do you, are we supposed to lump them all together or are there specific differences in these factions that you can delineate for us? Yeah, well... As I say, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. And of course, in the book, I identify basically five sectors that were all present uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, who uh, are now major players in the anti-democratic campaign that's ongoing. And that's the, the Patriot Militia folks. Uh, and that's, you know, that includes the Oath Keepers and Three Percenters and people like that. Uh, there are the street brawlers, the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer and, and American Guard and these other street brawling groups who are really, their function is to be, uh, is essentially the same function that the brown shirts played in uh, Hitler's Germany, that uh, of being providing street violence, uh, being a, a street violence mode that would, or a force that would basically enforce their uh, politics. And then there are the white nationalists. Um, and again, you know, these, these folks all, all overlap a lot. I mean, there's a lot of white nationalists who are Proud Boys. And, uh, and also some of these white nationalists are also um, militiamen. You know, you, there, there is a, quite a bit of overlap, but they are distinct in that, that some of them are focused purely on as in the case of the Patriots, they're just focused on, um, you know, doing paramilitary organizing. Um, they, whereas the street brawlers are really focused on trying to bring street violence to uh, scenes as, I mean, we've of course seen the Proud Boys be active in the past year going to drag queen readings and that sort of thing, right? They They are very adaptable to, the sort of issues of the moment and uh, bringing violence to those issues of the moment. And and then, the, so the, and then the third or the, the fourth yeah. group, I'm sorry, is the conspiracists and really conspiracism runs through all of these elements. Uh, but some people, particularly the QAnon types, their motive is purely, uh, their, their motives arise almost purely out of these conspiracy theories that they believe. So, um, and then finally, there are the mainstream enablers, the the people in Congress, the people in the right wing media, who mainstream and normalize this stuff and provide, you know, they're they're the ones out there telling us that that what happened January six was just a a protest that got out of hand, right? It's like it's so, like it's like if I was talking to a flat earther or someone who says that NASA never landed on the moon, I'm going. Or that God planted fossils in order to test our faith. Fire right. out. I'm, I'm going like, I don't, or that, that conception, the moment that the sperm penetrates the semi-permeable membrane of an egg, life begins and 
whenever you're talking to these people, it's like, what the hell is wrong with you? But when they're talking to you, they say, what the hell is wrong with you? So the lack of civil discourse, but then you're also looking at, in my opinion, this incredible stupidity that the earth is flat. And if you sail a ship, you're going to go off the end of it. They honestly, not in a bad way, they honestly simply believe that. Sure. Going up again in your, that's, I, I can't, I don't want to harp on it, but that's what you're going up against in your yeah. books. I yeah. read your books, but I'm already on your side. Yeah, yeah. No, it, and it's, it's like I said, it's almost an intractable problem because uh, it really does come down to uh, individual epistemology. You know, how, how do right. we know the world? And for some people, they know the world through reading Alex Jones. And they think that because they've come to believe that the media will not tell them the whole story, so they go looking for alternative so sources of information, and and they'll fall down those rabbit holes quite readily. Um, and uh, you know, it's I don't know that. Um, I mean, I, I think, for instance, this current. Uh, her fluffle on Twitter, in which uh, Elon Musk has been promoting uh, Joe Rogan uh, uh, attempts just, just to last night. Get, get, get Peter Hotez uh, to come on and debate RFK right. Jr. about the vaccines and the, the COVID response. And, you know, RFK Jr. is and, and Joe Rogan are basically claiming that they're completely cockamamie claims about virology and and how you know and vaccines and that sort of thing are have some basis in reality and so they want peter hotez the the virologist to debate them uh and they can't how do you, how can you actually have a, a debate between uh utter risible nonsense and established science uh it's it's like it's it's giving the utter risible nonsense the treats them as as having a viable point of view and it's not it's not a viable point of view so how can you how can you have that debate when there's really no debate to be had um so um yeah it, it's it's a behavioral thing that that comes from this epistemic crisis and um, I don't know that there's, uh, I just don't see any answer to it other than, I mean, ultimately, I just say that, look, uh, people are going to fall down these rabbit holes. What we have to do is, um, value the truth, promote the truth, try to stick to the value, you know, traditional values of logic and reason, uh, and adhere to it as, as firmly as we can. I mean, leftists have their own <laughs> propensities for conspiracism as well um and um but it, not nearly as severe <laughs> as what we have on the right but but i see it you know i mean it happens and of course a lot of the a lot of the folks who gone anti-vax were originally very kind of leftist i mean rfk jr used to be a, a you know an established liberal um and so, yeah, I mean, we're all capable of falling down these rabbit holes. And it's when we um, when we fail to, you know, demand adherence to, you know, the actual rules, <laughs> the actual rules of reality, logic and reason. All right. Well, what about what about situations where maybe we were wrong, like in the very beginning when there was no way Democrats were going to say that the. Uh, that COVID uh, started in the, uh, the the corona the novel coronavirus lab in Wuhan. Right. Now it appears pretty much that that's exactly where it started. So once in a while, we're yeah. Wrong. Well, of course, the the what, what happens is it's actually not clear that that it, it originated in the Wuhan lab. What they've shown is that it actually, um, that the that it has animal origins um, related to uh, the, it, it actually came from, uh, what are they, raccoon dogs. Right, the wet uh, market. But yeah, I would, on the wet I, market. You and I would have, if we had a debate now, 
I would take, and if I had to take a side, I would take the side just like John Stewart does. That yeah, look, look at the name of the lab. Duh, that's where it occurred. But that's but that's just a classic sure. argument. We could do it with civil yeah. Digits. Yeah, of course. And of course we can. And that's that is uh that's an important thing to have. But where where it goes wrong is when you start saying the Chinese developed it as a bioweapon. Correct. Uh as yeah. as a way to attack Trump. Correct. Um, and that is a crock. <laughs> well, the other thing is like it's like when uh, what's it? Who's the no spin zone? The guy that got canceled. I've forgotten his name. You know. Oh, Glenn Beck. No, before that, you know, on uh, on Fox. Um, oh, uh, it was Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, Bill O'Reilly. He was uh, talking to Christopher Dawkins, and and Dawkins was trying to convince him that uh, the tides are affected by the moon, and he refused to accept that. Yeah. And I was like, I what do you? There's nothing you can do with that. That's where it stops, right? He just, he refuses to accept the logic and the science of it. He can, yeah, yeah. he's entitled to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we have centuries of learning how to deal with pandemics and and <laughs> mass viral outbreaks or, 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 you know, disease outbreaks. And for most of the last century, at least since the, since the 1918 uh, yeah. influenza pandemic, um, society's been has gotten behind the using science as the best means to to attack this, and it does mean, I mean, it's because of what the science tells us. It does mean that there are times when our normal rights are 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 suspended in order to save society from these diseases right yeah. um and right. and and the, the key of course is that when the pandemic goes away those rights return and that's of course what we have seen post covid um you know initially everybody was told to stay in their homes uh and initially everyone was told to wear masks um, well, actually not. <laughs> Initially, they were told not to wear masks. And then, I mean, this is part of the problem is that science does go through periods where it's testing and trying to find out, and it will make stumbles as it did, uh, you know, with masking. Um, because initially they were, you know, initially they were concerned that they didn't have enough masks uh, in, in the pipeline for people to actually, for the medical professionals to have them available. So they were urging people not to wear masks just because they didn't have enough supply. And then they realized, oh, actually, it's not spread through touching, it's spread through aerosol, right? And that was how um, eventually they, they shifted. And, and then, but of course, those shifts create distrust. It's like, well, you guys don't really know what you're talking about. And it's true that that sometimes science makes mistakes, but it corrects those mistakes. It it should be capable of correcting those mistakes, and when we have I, to recognize that it does. When I'm in a uh, in our corporate park where I work, I would say thirty to forty percent of the people there believe in the basic PizzaGate theory, or when they go to their little. Right. functions or their golf outings their golf outings you know it's like their let's go brandon they say it they actually right. say it and i'm thinking yeah. or they, or trump won right and yeah right well, that's 70 percent i saw today but the point of it is is that in your debates and your meetings and your friends you have a lot of republican friends that are very intelligent people yeah i do yet yeah. yet <laughs> well, that's because um, authoritarianism is a hell of a drug, and it uh, affects uh, a broad range of personalities, including some of the most intelligent people you'll know uh, will also have authoritarian personalities. And what happens with authoritarian personalities is that, I mean, fun functionally, it's like the difference between fundamentalism in science you know fundament fundamentalism decides what the world is going is reaches its conclusions ahead of time and then goes searching for evidence to support it you know and whereas science gathers the evidence and then uh tries to build a, 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 a hypothesis based on 
the best evidence available uh, tries to create a, you know, decide what the, the reality is. And whereas a fundamentalist type will have already decided what their reality is. And this is how it is with people who have, have gone down these authoritarian rabbit holes. They really, for them, the narrative is what matters. The narrative being that, you know, uh, our America is under attack from these leftist forces. And yeah, maybe Trump gets this wrong or that wrong, or or maybe he does talk about grabbing women by the pussy, but he's still our guy and he's still fighting for us. And that sort of thing. And and that narrative is so attractive and so powerful to them that everything else can be discarded, you know. You and this is how uh this is how this ep epistemic crisis grows. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's how fundamentalist Christians, you know, I asked some of my friends, so Trump is what your role model? You're gonna sit down with your son and say, This is I want you to grow up to be exactly like this man. And they do admit that they don't. They don't want him, them to grow up like that. But the thing yeah. about it is, is that it's like what I was saying about Democrats. I joke that we're dumb, but the biggest problem is, I mean, I had this trial in New Hampshire and I, I, I was driving by a schoolyard and all the mothers have guns strapped to their holsters. And I'm going, this is impossible. What? They're in a schoolyard. I've never seen such a thing. And I'm such an idiot that I didn't accept that as a reality. Just like when you're talking about uh, um, the, the guys who believe in grooming and were at drag, they stand right outside the, the barrier where the drag queen show is or the, or the pride festival is just like this week. I mean, everything we're talking about has happened this week too. So they're standing right at the perimeter and they're, it's like crystal knock. They are waiting. They will shoot those AR-15s at some point. Yeah. And so the Democrats do not have, not that they should, but they don't have the weapons to foment this actual real civil war. Right. There's a gun shop near here, and all of a sudden, all the Democrats are going there wanting to buy guns, and they don't like the idea that they have to wait because, yeah. you know? Well, I, I think uh, Democrats uh, are really... Um, unfortunately, really wedded to the hope and belief that this this is just a brief aberration and that things will return to normal. And honestly, it's a kind of laziness because yes. um, it's basically this attitude that, oh, democracy will just take care of itself. It just naturally reproduces. But the reality is that democracies are always fragile there, and particularly when they're under attack, as art is now. And the failure to recognize that it's under attack is really uh, creates a huge opening for those forces attacking it. And so one of the things, you know, it's, we need to, uh, I, I think that there is, um, we need to get past our desire for a return to normalcy. We need to recognize that democracy can and will fail if we allow it to, and that uh, we need to, you know, not just fight for democracy, but I think we also need to restore our de democratic institutions because they've been hollowed out so much, you know, since the Reagan years uh, and and undermined by these forces trying to um, to take away people's rights that um, that we're not prepared to to actually take part in the stand up and actually do the fight to protect those rights and to protect those values so and to protect that democracy so um you know until, i'm afraid until we do wake up um that this is probably going to get worse well the thing about it is is that you know we have a constitution that's lasted 250 years which is a pretty good run yeah. so it's going to be like just every other empire and yeah the pendulum will swing back but it might be way after you and i are gone yeah, it not be with, it's not going to be within the next five years. Plus, you got China. Plus, you got Russia. Plus, you have AI. Yeah. You know, DeSantis is already running deep fake ads against Trump. Yeah, it's like, do you see why I'm saying it's very difficult for me to go on day to day without having some type of uh, medication? 
medication. <laughs> anxiety medication. Well, I almost needed anxiety medication after writing this book, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, I think that we're, um, you know, we're just in a very difficult period. And I, I, part of the problem is that um, it is part of our, our democratic complacency is part of the problem. Um, you know, I mean, the fact that, that, you know, we found out to the day today that the Justice Department suppressed the investigation into January. 6th, for a year. For a year. Um, that, uh, and it was really out of this, this idea that, you know, oh, well, you know, we, we can't, we can't push them too far. And, and I think that ultimately, you know, we're going to have to push them too far because the, we, we can't, the option is to concede to um, their insane nonsense, to concede to their upside down version of reality. Well, uh, what, about the, what about the fact when you say Democrats are lazy, what about the fact that for some reason, everyone has to be between 76 and 85 years old in order to have any power in this country? So you got the idea, of, okay, Biden is either senescent or he isn't. He falls down, big deal. So did Bush, yeah. so did Ford. But he's not with it. In well, there, there, Kamala Harris is really dumb. There, there oh. are lots, lots of ways that our democratic institutions have been hollowed out. One of them has been, of course, the influence of money in politics. Um, and the what's happened, of course, as a result of that is that, you know, for one thing, we have billionaires underwriting uh, this destruction of the information space. But we also have liberals um, who built, have built, you know, particularly liberal Democrats who've built a system of powers such that, as you say, we've, uh, the, we have a gerontocracy on top of or basically leading the, the liberal faction in the country. And, um, and those folks are still living in the 1970s when we could still reach across the aisle and shake hands with Republicans. Well, Republicans have demonstrated that they're not viable partners in this democracy because they're antagonistic to to democracy now. Um, and so, you know, maybe they'll come back around, but in the meantime, we better play hardball. I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think playing softball with them is gonna work. I think we have to get really hard nosed about our dealings with them. I think. I think we have to be willing to put them in j jail when they commit crimes. And I think we have to stand up to these forces. I mean, what happened during the pandemic was just atrocious because we pulled it, we allowed the forces behind Trump and the forces of the Republican Party to politicize a pandemic, uh, which I believe the politicization of the pandemic led to hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, because it made so many more people vulnerable. It also messed up the ability to uh, to uh, do uh, anti-COVID measures such as the vaccine. Um, and right. this this issue continues today. Yeah, but it's funny because it's like it's like Stalin. You know, one death is tragedy; a million deaths is uh, is a st statistic. And Trump. Right. It's like when Trump says, well, why can't we just nuke him? He has no empathy or consideration as any narcissist wouldn't or sociopath. Sure. But now what's really funny to me is like, I really, I kind of like Nikki Haley because she's intelligent and articulate. And that's, a, you know, like I say, knee-jerk responses on my part. But the funniest thing, and again, trying to paint you into a corner, the funny <laughs> thing about this campaign thus far to me is Chris Christie, because Chris Christie is the only one who can say whatever he wants about Trump. He can right. trap him whatever he wants, but none of the other candidates yet can even come anywhere close to doing that. So I no. think he's the, he's the one that can make him the emperor with no without clothes, I think. Yeah, although the the and the problem that he faces is the reason for the cowardice among the other candidates, which is that um they don't want to support 
Trump's candidacy, candidacy, but they want Trump's voters. They want Trump's voters. And Christie is obviously not trying to uh, attract yeah. Trump voters. Um, but who he's trying to attract, I don't know, because of the numbers in between uh, of people, uh, non-Trump voters who uh, also uh, wouldn't vote for, for Biden um, is pretty tiny. Well, the thing about it is, is that I'm scared. Well, actually, I, you know, I am one of those kind of lazy Democrats because I like looking at it. I like, I still like watching it, which is not a good attitude, but I'm looking at it like, okay, Trump goes to jail. He can still run for president. He's 35 years old. He was born in the United States. He, he could probably win from jail at this point right now. And everyone hates DeSantis because he's nasty, nasty person. And so is his wife. So he's not going to, I think Nikki Haley might do it. But what if Trump runs as a third party candidate, throws the election into the house right now, you have 25 red, 25 blue States. What would happen then? Well, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's all up in the air, isn't it? Um, well, running as a third party candidate, I think actually would destroy, I think that would actually pretty much guarantee Biden's reelection, um, to tell you the truth, because he would draw a lot of votes away from the Republican party, but then there are true Republican voters who wouldn't, who wouldn't vote for that third party. So it would basically wind up splitting the right wing vote and leaving the left-wing field, uh, the liberal field, uh, open for Biden. Um, that's pretty much, that would, that's my calculus. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he talked about it right after January 20th. He talked about, he called it the Patriot Party. Uh, if, if you remember that he was threatening to leave the Republican Party um, after the insurrection. And, uh, <laughs> and then Kevin McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago and, and talked him out of it, basically. Um, but he did so by bending the knee to Trump. Um, so, um, yeah, the, I, I do think that there are scenarios um, where, where Trump could pull something off. Um, I don't see, yeah, none of the other Republican candidates. I mean, what was special about Trump was that he has charisma. He, he has remarkable charisma. And uh, in particular, he's incredibly telegenic. And let me tell you, Ron DeSantis is like, oh my God, get that guy off my TV, please. You know? <laughs> and, 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 you know, Nikki Haley is probably the only one who's probably telegenic enough uh, to pull it off. But she's also, she's also an incredibly uninspiring speaker. Um, so I, I, I honestly, none of them seem to have in my view, the wherewithal to actually pull it off. But that's why I find but, the but, corners but, like but, but thank I you. Do, what will happen? I do think that, I'm asking that, you what will happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what will happen is that there, there's going to be an incredible amount of turmoil around the 2024 election. Um, and I do think that these militia, these paramilitary uh, militias are going to get involved. Um, I think the Proud Boys are going to get involved. I mean, we're already seeing the Proud Boys uh, turning up, like I say, to all these school board meetings and library boards and and showing up and the militiamen show up at, at to threaten state legislatures uh, and that sort of thing. So um, I think there is, I think there's gonna be violence in the next year. Um, and actually, I uh, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but I think that actually plays in, in in favor of the Democrats, because I think people are very much turned off by violence, but it's sort of in their nature. They have to threaten us. They have, they're, they're wired to attack and threaten uh, anybody who doesn't, you know, it's authoritarian aggression against uh, anyone who fails to bend the knee to the glorious leader. Well, and, well, you know, you, you've said authoritarian and the force that it has, but fear, as Hitler used, yes, fear is also an incredible motivator, and well, I, it induces authoritarian response in the public. Right. But if you have, an, if I have someone with an AR-15 in front of me, I'm probably going to do what he tells me to do. You yeah. know, that's pretty much it. 
And I, and if they threaten, yeah. if they say something like simply enough, you have wonderful, you have some beautiful children. That's all they have to say to me. For me yeah. To well, and unfortunately, I think part of our complacency is the belief that I think most of us have that uh, our defense against that is law enforcement, that we can send the police to arrest these guys. We can have the police defend us against these uh, paramilitaries and that sort of thing. And I think the last four or five years have actually demonstrated that, um, yes, sometimes the police will and no, sometimes they won't. Uh, they're they're not uh, be, mainly because police forces in America have been so uh, politicized themselves. They've been turned into basically right wing functionaries um, who are out to enforce the rules of white supremacy. And uh, we've certainly seen that in the the racist policing uh, that has become you know reached a crisis point in 2020, um, as well as their behavior during the Trump years and uh, uh, certainly what I saw in the streets of Portland and Seattle was very troubling to me. The way that, that the police clearly favored and almost protected the Proud Boys and these right-wing extremists who were invading. I mean, these people were, <laughs> were busing to Portland and busing to Seattle, these large groups of thuggish men who lived in exurban and rural areas and bring them in en masse to basically invade these urban liberal cities and bring violence to those cities, create scenes of violence that would further their narrative about the violent left. And, um, you know, of course, it was hilariously during 2020, they also uh, started spreading rumors that Antifa was busing in uh, busloads of black clad uh, leftists to places like Klamath Falls and Coeur d'Alene, you know, <laughs> and there, there was, and, and, and people would turn out. I mean, we had uh, people turning out in mass in all those towns, revving their pickup trucks around town, waving their AR-15s, ready to take on those evil Antifa. And of course they never showed because that was never happening, but that was just projection on their part. They were just, I mean, what they were claiming Antifa was doing, the busing in <laughs> groups of people, was in fact what they had been doing themselves for the previous three years. So, um, you know, <laughs> this. Uh, at any rate, uh, certainly we saw, um, and the troubling part about it was that the, for me, is that the police in Portland in particular uh, failed to, uh, did not, uh, do what I think police traditionally do, which is defend their communities from outsiders, uh, right. from outside thugs. They actually saw the outside thugs as their allies, and uh, frequently, you know, treated them with kid gloves and and often protected them. Written, um, written and, and we know that we know that forces of you know police forces around the country have in fact been infiltrated. By the other thing is the Nazis other thing, and white supremacists. Yeah, the admixture of political views in the police force is essentially the same as the admixture outside the police force. But the thing about it is, is, and this doesn't sound right, but a farmer in North Dakota who has these points of view does not scare me. What scares me is the guy that's going to come to my office the next day and be our IT guy or, yeah. or go back to his job as CPA. The guy, it's kind of like the guy you see at the ball game with his face painted and screaming and yelling. But the next day, he's practicing law and is in a trial and just a regular guy who plays golf and has his country club. Those are the guys that scare me. Sure. Well, I mean, think about the com composition of the mob that attacked the Capitol. Um, they, what we found was that, no, there were no Antifa <laughs> in that mob. And in fact, the majority of, of the white people who attacked Capitol that day were were actually um, middle-aged business owners uh, who came from, you know, they ran, con they own construction companies. They're re actually pretty well-to-do. Uh, most of them are not from uh, working class, which is, I think, one of the myths about the January 6th mob. These were not working class people for the most part. I mean, there were obviously 
a number of them mixed in there, but the majority of them were upper middle class people, frequently business owners of their own, and uh, but people who were a originally uh, avid Fox watchers and got basically radicalized by Fox, sucked into the Alex Jones, Infowars, alternative universe, and um, became radicalized. What scared me the most was I was at the gym before January 6th working out and these guys next to me were going, so you're going to go to Washington this weekend? I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, that's what they were going for. But again, being dumb or being ignorant or just not thinking it was possible. That's what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, Trump's uh, be, be there, it will be wild uh, tweet was the clarion call to all these people. It was the signal. It was the green light that they were looking for. And he issued that. He published that, on, I think, on December 16th. And um, within, you know, immediately, uh, the Proud Boys who were standing by for Trump's order uh, realized that uh, this was their this was their green light. This was Trump beckoning them. But it wasn't just the Proud Boys. It was the Oath Keepers and all of these people who uh, really saw this as as their opportunity. And of course, the, the, it is a narrative that had been built brick by brick uh, over the previous four years. The arrest in uh, New York, the Stormy Daniels thing, not going to go anywhere. Uh, the indictment yeah. with regard to the, docu the, doc the classified documents is something. Georgia, if she just gets off her butt and does this, may very well actually mean something. Yeah. Because it's so clear, it's tell that there's a telephone conversation. It's it's so blatant that it would be if if that fails, then I think we're at the tipping point that you've discussed. Yeah. Well, and, and Smith also has a January six. Uh, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, and I think that that um, that one. I mean, it, it, there has to be some kind of consequences. There has to be some kind of actual uh, as particularly with the roger stones and the, the people out there who really deserve to be fully investigated and probably should be behind bars um but um you know uh, the the documents case out of mar-a-lago uh, could be worse than we know particularly if it turns out that he was selling these state secrets um you know, or or letting you know, giving basically giving to the, to the Saudis. I don't think it was just a coincidence that the Saudis gave Jared Kushner five billion dollars after or two, shortly after the the insurrection. Um, you know, I don't think that. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of smoke there, and I suspect that there's that Smith has probably found some of the fire. I. Having been around federal prosecutions for much of my journalistic life, I'm really hesitant to second guess prosecutors who particularly um, are being careful uh, to because they're focused on getting a conviction and they move carefully. Uh, a lot of times they won't make the move until they have the evidence firmly in place and they certainly won't reveal it to the public if they do have it until the trial. Okay. So, so we, we don't really know what's in that documents case, but it could very well be worse than okay. we're getting on, on the face so far. But I, but I do think a January 6th investigation is absolutely essential because, um, because that was the attack on our democracy and it can't go without consequence uh, for those people, for those mainstream enablers. Well, who, so who, who hold positions of power even now? The, the, the Josh Hollies and the Mar uh, Marjorie Taylor Greens. Well, okay. As we wind down, and maybe this is a good way to conclude because whoever we're talking about right now, Trump is the point of inflection. So it's just suppose one or more of these crimes ends up with him being in prison. Do you think that will help his popularity or hurt his popularity? I think on balance it hurts. 
Um, yeah, I mean, for his authoritarian followers, it will help his uh, standing uh, because, you know, he's the leader and then he'll be martyred and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that they're particularly, you know, particularly if it turns out that he has been selling America's state secrets to foreign powers, um, I think there will be a lot of people peel away. Um, you know, a lot of it just depends on the nature of what comes out um, in terms of whether it'll hurt or help, hurt or help. But um, yeah, obviously for, you know, true believers, it's not going to have a real serious effect. Uh, but for anyone with even a, a little <laughs> finger hold in reality, uh, I would think that it might give them pause. So I would say as the books, as a bookseller, I would say that, well, one, I don't want to say the book's entertaining, but it is entertaining. And, and two, it gives people who weren't quite sure, maybe I'm, maybe you're right. Maybe people who are on the fence would be convinced by this book, but most importantly, it creates a three-dimensional picture of what's going on. People just see it in the press as two dimensions. And when you go back to the beginning and pile on and pile on evidence of what's been going on, I think that really makes a difference for some people. I know it did for me because I didn't. Yeah. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Well, I, I didn't. I, I mean, honestly, I didn't set out when I set out to write the book to try to convince uh, anybody on the right, uh, because I don't think they can be convinced. Uh, what I did try to do was build um, really a deep and powerful case for uh, the need for the rest of us to get off our asses and defend democracy. Um, I appreciate that. And I thank you so much. We could go, obviously, we could go on for hours easily, days. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much. And thanks for all the good work you're doing now and all the work you, you've done in the past because you have an excellent resume about trying to keep this country alive and free. So thank you so much, David. I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you for having me, Sam. I really enjoy talking with you. Likewise. Bye-bye. All right.